go. Let's go. Okay. So welcome to, I want to call it a live stream. It kind of is. There's tons of people online. Um, you can monetize my account if you want. Uh, thank you, Jason from Arkansas for the $5 donation. Um, keep, keep up with the... <laughs> I like how people are like, I wonder, I wonder if that's true or not. Um, I'm actually going to bump the readings to, um, for today to next class. Did anyone do the readings? Did anyone do the Edward Harris readings? Betsy did. Betsy, of course you did. And I'm honored and, and thankful. Like I expected you to. Would be disappointed if you had not. Your books are in there. Thank My you. books are older. Oh, good. Yeah. So no, so no worries. And again, with all this for real, if this was a class that was for credit, I would treat it exactly the same. Like for better or for worse, maybe it's a, it's a negative aspect of mine, but I'm fairly lenient um, and just don't care. Like we'll get through this stuff. That's so fine. I don't like school marmish stickler. Like it has to be today. You know what's going to happen if we don't discuss this today? We're going to die. <laughs> so whatever they come in, it's fine. But keep up with the syllabus and look what we're doing. Right, this week is a, a very kind of focused week. Today, 1848 to 60 where that takes us up, up to the war, as we we're talking about the war begins actually in that year, if you want to be really specific. If you want to say that with South Carolina secession on December 20th, 1860, the war really commences then, even four months before Fort Sumner and the official start of the war, you're not wrong. So we're really going to go up to the war today, and then we're going to read Ayers and McPherson, just a full discussion next class, which is even good. I'm actually even happy to postpone discussion next class. If your book still has not arrived, whatever. Well, I'll just, you know, we'll go over it, take your notes if you want. And then you see on Monday the 24th, we do an in-class competition. What is that going to be? It should be super, super fun. Really cutthroat. I want to find a way to make it like, um, to make it like the agony and the ecstasy. Those that win are proud to win and look down on those they defeated. Those who are defeated are in pain and regret their horrible answers or lack of performance, whatever. Is the competition based on knowledge or insight? Mm -hmm. based, it's based on looks, above all. Um, looks. Yeah, it's based about, about that. <laughs> I, watched an interesting, I watched an interesting conspiracy theory that Sweden is actually where the New World Order is located in Stockholm, that they run the world. Apparently the Wallenberg family owns like a third of all the world's telecommunications and this kind of stuff. And the Swedes purposely make themselves out to be like, oh, look at us, you know, Ikea, uh, <laughs> Swedish fish. <laughs> yeah, it's like we're like innocent and whatever, we don't matter, but they actually run everything. Huh. So if you want to be Sweden, you're saying you want to dominate everyone covertly. Yes. Yeah. Like last year, the competition was like a game show. But was it based on knowledge or on your thoughts mm -hmm. about things? No. It makes a big difference to me. <laughs> I already said looks. I already answered that question. It's based on knowledge. It's based on knowledge. We'll have like it'll be like what we had so far to date kind of stuff. It'll be fun. Look, the stereotype of the old SAT before it's worth like two thousand four hundred points or whatever. Even like maybe better an IQ test. You can't study for it. Like that's what I want. I want people just to have fun with it. It'll be a fun game. Okay. And then you see, starting on January twenty sixth, detailed chronology on secession for the next month, right? From the 26th of January until the last day of February, which is Appomattox, it's the end of the war, uh, the, the peace treaty, the surrender of Lee to Grant and the end of the war. We're just gonna go bonkers hard on the war, just totally focused before on the back end, really getting into the readings. Okay, so just keep that in mind. It always gives us, gives us a good look ahead and also helps you. I hope that you attend all the classes. I can't tell you how special this is. Sincerely, taps to nice, um, like um, a group of people together. It's very, very nice. The room accommodates it well too. But if you're like, I want to miss for some reason or I can't be here, you can also strategically plan that. Okay, Maria, why is that funny? Tell me. I, I'm actually be really curious. I have such high respect for your opinion. I, I want to know, why, why are you laughing? People are going to strategically plan what they say. Not gonna they could, you could. I've given them that option. I don't know. I would do that. <laughs> I, would I guess we always do projection, right? So if like I was trying to be like, do something shocking, if I was like a five-year-old kid, I'd be like, look, the wall's a dinosaur. And I'd believe it because I think that would shock me. I mean, you'd be like, I'm not even going to look. So maybe I would strategically plan, but you would not. <clears throat> Whatever. Whatever you want to do. Okay, let us begin. All right, first thing. Here's the five points or the four points I have for you today that we're going to discuss. It's very, very, very simple. Okay, number one, the Wilmot Provisio. Wilmot, not Mont, W-I-L-M-O-T. Wilmot Provisio. Number two, the Compromise of 1850. 
three, the 1854 Kansas-Nebraska Act, which then leads into two kind of sub points, you can say, quote unquote, bleeding Kansas, 55 and 56, and the Dred Scott decision, and then John Brown. John Brown's raid of Harper's Ferry, Virginia. Today it is West Virginia. Because, someone tell me why. What's interesting about West Virginia and the Civil War? It's created in the Civil War because the West Virginians are yeoman farmers and don't want to be with the slave holding Virginia, so they actually secede from Virginia to join, join the Union. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, and the word you used, you answered it perfectly, and the word that you used was the operative word is secede. <clears throat> 11 states will secede from the Union to form the Confederate States of America. The Confederacy has 13 stars on its flag. Um, and there, there's three states you can argue that really kind of are de facto uh, in the Confederacy, Maryland, Kentucky, and, and Missouri, although they, they never officially joined. West Virginia is the only state that secedes northward during the war. There is one state that secedes this way, um, the western half of Virginia, modern day West Virginia. So Harper's Ferry today, if you want to visit it, you'd have to go to West Virginia. At that time, though, it was still a part of of even larger Virginian Commonwealth that, than we have today. Okay, that takes us from the Wilmot Provisio in 1846 through 59, that takes us up to the Civil War. At that point in this class, the four themes that we begun, began the class with, a lot of the stuff we talked last class about, right, the Mormons, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, the Mexican-American War, the whole manifest destiny, all those kind of things. If you have all of that as we enter the war, I think you are so much better off for it. And you'll have so much more of a, of a richer and more nuanced understanding of the Civil War, as opposed to we just have we dive into Fort Sumner and First Manassas the first day of class. And, and you're like, what is that even about? I have no contextual background for it. Now you will. Someone talk to you about the Wilmot Provisio. What is, what is this? Do you have any clue what this is? I will say Wilmot is a Democrat from Pennsylvania, my home state. And, and who cares? Well, that, that's completely useless information. But why, why would I even mention that? There's no reason, just because I like personal details. He's a Democrat who becomes a free soiler. Ooh, that's going to be the key. I don't know what the Wilmot Provisio is, but free soil party sounds like something. It sounds like I can play around with it somehow. And indeed, eventually he'll become a Republican. He'll join the party of Lincoln. <laughs> I cannot stand when politicians do that. That is so annoying. I'm, I'm serious. Like, I'm not going to ever tell you how I feel about Republicans or Democrats or whatever. I did kind of tell you how I felt about monarchy before the class, but I can't now that we're on the, the live stream. Um, I can, of course. I hate that too. Why can't I not? I can say whatever I want. Right? Are just, are we, do we have free speech or not? I can say whatever I want to say, but I'm not going to. But I hate when people do that. Like, ooh, I'm running for so freaking obnoxious. Like, I'm gonna try, I'm running for Florida's second district. And I believe in freedom. I, that's why I joined the party of Lincoln and Reagan, blah, 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 blah. I, I'm not voting for that person. I don't care if they believe everything I believe, I'm just automatically not gonna vote for them. The other person is like, I wanna put dolphins on the moon. That's what we should put, put taxpayer money for. They don't say party of Lincoln and Reagan, I'll vote for that person. What does that mean? That, that Wilmot eventually becomes a free soiler. He moves from the Democrats. And what is it, the nature of the Democratic Party at this time? Anyone know anything about antebellum politics? If you don't, that's why you're in this class. No problem, right? We're all going to learn together. Well, the Democrat Party at that point is the inheritors of the Jeffersonian agrarian ideals. And then that really gets heightened up to. Brilliant. Keep going. Check mark. Excellent. Democratic, democratic, like democracy to the utmost slash populism really the common man is key with jacks the jacksonian era um and then going on from there that starts that that really extinct, uh, i guess gets into a lot of individualism and keeping the federal government out of people's business uh and especially into the institution of slavery in the 1840s and 50s very good okay excellent answer Anyone, uh, anyone on the Zoom chat too? I see all the people on, on the Zoom. It's always a pleasure to have you with us. I'm so honored. It's the best part of the pandemic, the fact that we can do this kind of like dual 
nodal learning. So if anyone has stuff on the Zoom too, they want to put in the chat as well, I'll read those just so you know. You don't have to be a, a passive participant. You don't have to participate, but if you so choose, please do as well. Yeah, okay, the Republicans and the Republican Party does not exist yet. It will come in some ways out of the ashes of the Whig Party. But the Republicans, what we'll know with Abraham Lincoln at all is going to be about, yeah, kind of the North and the cities and stuff. And despite the fact there's a strong democratic presence in the kind of Irish machines, um, the Irish democratic Catholic machines, places like New York and Boston. Wilmot is this Democrat who's very much like a Jeffersonian, Jacksonian, agrarian guy. He is against slavery. The, the Free Soil Party is, our entire party is based on whatever land comes into the U.S. conglomerate should be for should, should be anti-slavery should be free soil a very good parallel would be today like if someone started a new party it literally was the anti-abortion party or the pro-life party and that was it like we don't care that we have no other platform our only view is, is pro-life that's not only the most important thing for us it's the only thing we care about you can literally believe anything else you want any other issue we're not even gonna really like we're gonna yell at you as you walk in the door the first day like we don't care what your view is on this 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 the only issue you have to have is this the free soilers have this kind of ultimate, and there's arguments for that, right? That's bad because then good issue, you might think, but there's a lot of fracturing or no, that is the way to do it. If you want to get things done, be as simple as possible, right? Like just focus on one thing and really perfect it. Wilmot's provisio is this. If you're finally waiting to say, what is this thing, provisio, this suggestion, this kind of like proposal law, he says, I want to model it on the Northwest Ordinance of 1787. Keep that in your back pocket. That's going to be important for the Dred Scott decision, which prohibited, prohibited slavery in the, what was then the Northwestern part of the United States. When I think of Northwest today, I think of us. I think of Portland and Seattle. What is the Big Ten school that challenges this and explains this idea of the Northwest Ordinance? Mm -hmm. Anyone a fan of Big Ten football mm -hmm. or... It, yes. Northwestern? Yeah, the Northwestern Wildcats. And Evanston, you, went to law school. you went to law school there. Good. Great school. Um, Evanston, Illinois, 20 miles or so, right? 20 miles north of Chicago, right there. On the border of Chicago. Border, border Chicago, Chicago, right. Yeah, it's Chicago. In Chicago, though, there's signs like our Big Ten University. This is Chicago's right. thing. Yeah. Northwestern. That's If there's a school called Northwestern, I want it to be like in like Wenatchee or something. Yeah. Like Chicago. So, I mean, it's not even in the northwest of Chicago right. or Illinois. Right. No, yeah. It sort of is in the northwest of Illinois. It's no, the it's north. Not, but it's not what? Okay. It's, it's not a lake. It's sure. nothing. It's just Chicago. It should, be called, <laughs> it should be called Chicago, whatever university. C W C W U. Um, <laughs> right? Am I wrong, though? Uh, all right. So, he, and I see a thing on the chat. Thank you to whoever wrote that. I, my eyes, I wish they were better. I think I have, well, thank God, I think I have pretty good vision, but it's not better than 20. I wish it was. I wish it was like 28. That'd be sick. Or 20 zero. <laughs> you have to be, everyone understands how that works, right? 20 zero would mean that I can read things at 20 feet away that you have to be like this. That'd be like Hawkeye level. But I don't, my eyes are not that good. Zero. Excuse me? Who can read it at zero? Me. That's what I'm bragging about. Right? <laughs> I'm, I'm imagining, I wish I could brag about it. Need something a little more so let's do 20 point, let's do 21, 21 vision, one feet, one foot away. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, neither here nor there. Uh, Wilmot, I, I see the chat, I'm going to come to you in one second really quickly. Wilmot says, so let's answer this question finally. He says, whatever new land will be acquired during the Mexican American War. And obviously, I do the chronology in this class in order for a reason. So you have the context, you know what the Mexican American War is. And Wilmot is already getting very American, very cocky and, and self-assured. We're definitely going to win. America always wins, that kind of idea. He's proposing this in 1846 as the war is breaking open. And he says, look, when we eventually win, whatever land settlement comes, I want that to be all free soil. I want there to be a, a rider on whatever bill or whatever kind of peace treaty that guarantees no slavery because I'm against slavery. I believe slavery is an abomination. I am more than that. Well, again, this is why slavery is such a critical issue now because of the Civil War. People in the South really, really don't like this. A lot of people in the South are very, very pro-slavery, right? All these plantation owners, et cetera, and they want the exact opposite. And in fact, a lot of these decisions will, will fault, the fault line, break over this question of being pro or anti-slavery. That is the whole thing that happens in Bleeding Kansas that we'll get to in a second. Um, Wilmot's, the key to Wilmot's provisio is the concept of containment. Okay, what does that mean as I go look at the chat? 
So again, Wilma Provisio, whatever land we acquire in the war against the Mexicans should be free. All right, putting it forward. And my main policy is containment. If you're talking about containment, you can jump ahead of the Cold War and George Kennan, the long telegram, anti-Soviet type policies in the Cold War. What does containment mean? And you can apply the same metric to communism Kennan did that Wilmot is trying to apply to slavery now. What is that? Basically just don't let it spread any further, keep it where it is. Yeah, maybe we can't solve it, too bad. We'd like to eliminate it totally, but at least we can stop it from metastasizing further. Excellent. Kevin O writes, I just learned about this class yesterday. Welcome, Kevin. It's great to have you in the class. Is there any way to watch the recordings from previous sessions? Yes. Anna Kresslins, who is our awesome communications director, always posts stuff on the Vandal Catholic YouTube site. So I record them now to the cloud, and then she accesses them, downloads, attaches them, does all that. So Kevin, I'm not sure when they'll be posted. That's in, in Anna's purview. Um, she's very busy, like everyone, whenever she has a chance to get to it, but she always does that. So yes, there is. Yeah, you're absolutely welcome. But again, great to have you in the class. Um, okay, the bill passes the House, but fails in the Senate. Ever hear something like that? It's just like everything now, right? Well, I'll get to the House and the Senate and blah, 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 and Joe Manchin and Kristen Sinema and whatever. Um, yeah, right. This is exactly what's happening now, right? Biden is build back better, blah, 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 whatever version of that. And he's so angry at Joe Manchin, who happens to be from West Virginia. Talk about how much this class really speaks to our times now, <laughs> right? And Manchin is actually running, he's calling the shots. And Biden is pissed or he doesn't care, who knows? But it just, it's not working, right? We can get it through the House, but we need it through both House, both sets of the full congressional body. Same thing here. And what does this explain? Well, Wilmot's upset, obviously, and people who are anti-slavery are upset. And really, anti-slavery begins in America as a strong movement with William Wood Garrison, his newspaper, The Liberator, in 1831. And remember, again, I'm, I'm, I am going to be self, like, I'm going to be very um, conceited here. Like, I designed this class epically, boss. But I talked about that earlier, and I said, in New England, remember the four themes, the strong puritanical nature, they lose their faith, but what do they retain? They retain this desire to change society. And as we're talking about the Wilmot Provisio, 1846, I can already tell you in New England, not only the anti-slavery society, William Lord Garrison, 31, you have the temperance society um, popping up. 1848, the year uh, Guadalupe Hidalgo was signed, the first great movement in American feminism takes place, the Seneca Falls Conference in New York, surprise, surprise. It's always Northern people, this uh, reformist zeal, right? Who are trying to make society better. That's the good argument. The, their opponents say they're trying to boss everyone around, tell them what to do. And it's still kind of this way today, right? If you look at the highest rates of compliance with whatever in America, government policy is always New Hampshire and New York and Massachusetts and lowest is always the hillbillies of Mississippi and Eastern Washington and stuff, right? If, if you want a really good book, if you want a really good book, read Colin Woodward, American Nations. Unfortunately, he's from Massachusetts, but it is a good book. <laughs> um, and uh, what was it? The book's name? American Nations. Okay. By Colin Woodward. He says there's really 11 nations in America, like Appalachia, the Deep South, and basically the left coast, as he calls it, which is imagine Seattle and like I-5 all the way down California, coastal highway. LA, San Diego, blah, 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 all that, they have most in common with their views with New York City and New England. And there's a reason why, like, and flyover country. And the most, it's the most intolerable people, he says, and he's, he's actually very, very fair. But I mean, the, the people that the government hates the most, so to speak, and gets angry, and like the ones that are hardest to tell what to do are in the far West, right? Not California, but like Wyoming and Montana and Idaho and stuff. And you don't need a book to know this. This is like common knowledge. But so right away, this not only shows the kind of cultural Woodward-like breaks, but it's going to show that look how important slavery is going to be in fracturing the country. And my friends, indeed it is. Before I move to number two, the Compromise of 1850, does anyone know what the Missouri Compromise of 1820 is? What is the Missouri Compromise of 1820? We've already talked about Wilmot. Again, to close up Wilmot, I want no one confused. A bill on anything that comes out of the Mexican-American War, free soil. Passes in the House, fails in the Senate. Oh, I guess America is going to be riven apart on the slavery question. And it already is. And this can be another big fact leading up to the war. Got it. All of you got that. What is the Compromise of 1820? The Compromise of 1820 works big time in, uh, in tandem with, in conversation with the next two things I'll talk to you about. The Compromise of 1850 and Kansas, Nebraska Act 1854. What is the Compromise of 1820? Also known as the Missouri Compromise. It said 
no slavery above the 3630 parallel. And everyone's like, 3630 parallel? You might as well, yeah, Maria, your face says it perfectly. What does that mean? I have no clue. If I told Maria that was like in Belize, she'd be like, okay, actually it's the Arctic, whatever. It's a line that runs it, and I, but I agree. Seriously, I'm, I'm, and I shouldn't speak for maybe you're like a cartographer and you know longitude and latitude, latitude perfectly. Um, Minneapolis is exactly at 45 degrees, exactly halfway between the North Pole and the equator. So Not relevant, but true. I didn't know, you know that, that's awesome. I didn't, the, you know where it also is at 45 degrees? In New Meadows, Idaho. Okay. If you're driving up there on, if you're coming back from, Trish, you know how awesome that road is, right? Trish, I, you look at the kind of person who knows exactly the book on tape. You crank up the full volume when you go Boise to Moscow and you're like New Meadows that's usually getting the good part of the book <laughs> because New Meadows is so gross wow. you have to have the book interesting at that point <laughs> you know <laughs> that serves the kind of anesthetic is lovely. it's disgusting it is lovely yeah. <laughs> I said it I said it earlier in the class I said it earlier in the class I would never ever I hope I'm a nice person I think I'm fairly nice mm -hmm. I think so <laughs> <laughs> I would never make fun of something if I actually meant it if you're actually wondering what does you really think about think about the cities that actually never ever mentioned like maybe he doesn't like those places who first of all you no one should care what i think at all really you should not um i hope we all enjoy this class together but my opinion is completely worthless new meadows is great it's actually it's at the 45th parallel as well um except the thing it's totally scumbag about new meadows is like so this woman e evie Litton, wrote a really sick with it book called pacific northwest hot springs from 1994 she's from new zealand and she, typical like Australia, New Zealand, like no purpose to life, but travel the world, right? Comes and she goes and explores all these hot springs and like does whatever, whatever freaking people from there do, no, like nothing, just parties all day. But she writes this really, really good book and talks about all the hot springs in Idaho. It's an amazing guide. And it shows all this kind of like nice archipelago of hot springs around the Smith's Ferry area. And they're all free. Like they should be. They're on public land. And Evie Litton reminds us like, you know, be a good person, pack out what you packed in, blah, blah, blah. In New Meadows, there's a hot spring that you have to pay for, right? First of all, epic fail. Hmm. Like, we're going to go, I'm like, definitely not. I don't care if it's a penny, just the, 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 the thing of it. And it's like in some kind of green barn shed. It's like, it's like a haunted house plus hot spring. <laughs> you know, like, oh, you know, like, here's where our cows graze inside and lay around in their filth and take a, I'm being, I'm being unfair, but like, that's negative. That's a negative part of a 45th parallel night, how I would say. The compromise of 1820 said there's no slavery above the 3630 parallel. All you have to know is imagine a line running across the U.S. And above that, the, the, the bottom part of it is the state of Missouri. It's called the Missouri Compromise. Why? Because they agreed, these legislators, no slavery above the 3630 parallel except for Missouri. Missouri can have slavery. Okay? And this is 1820. This is eight years after the, um, well, five years after the Battle of New Orleans and the War of 1812. Already, Wilma Provisio, Compromise of 1820, already this question of, is, is this, this real, you know, severe social issue, the way abortion is today and picking whatever, that really defines this time, slavery versus free soil, slavery versus anti-slavery, how is that going to play out in kind of legislative decisions? Well, the Compromise of 1850, this is number two. We finished Wilmot, here's number two. Compromise of 1850 has uh, five, five points. Okay, so you can put Compromise of 1852 and then below it 2A, 2B, 2C, I would do it that way. If I didn't show up to class a minute before, I would have had that on the board. Um, that's the way I like to do it. You do whatever you wanna do. Number one was California is admitted as a free state. The first stipulation, and what, what are these compromises about? Guys, yes. If you're like, are these compromises basically between the pro and anti-slavery lobbies in America? Yeah, they are. California will be admitted as a free state. That's a bone thrown to Wilmot after his provision has been long set, set on fire and burned and stomped over by, by the Senate. California will be admitted as a free state, number one. Number two, the Texas border will be settled. The Texas border will be settled. And this is in the wake of the Mexican-American War. Number three, the slave trade is banned in Washington, D.C., so the first three principles, well, Texas one is kind of whatever, but definitely number one, California is a free state and slave trade ban in D.C. are pro-anti-slavery lobby, right? But the next two are arguably uh, for the pro-slavery lobby. Number four is popular sovereignty in the West. That means whoever lives in these states, like Nebraska, like Kansas, whatever, can vote if they want slavery or not. This is already going to be a direct challenge to the Compromise of 1820, right? Because that said, 
We don't care what people think, just period, no. Except for Missouri, that little enclave, above the 36-30 parallel, no slavery period, no matter what anyone thinks. Well, it's popular sovereignty now, it seems like that might violate it, and we're gonna see that in a second. And number five, the Fugitive Slave Act. If you've seen that movie, 12 Years a Slave, the idea that the slave could escape and be returned back south, all that. Um, that is arguably the most controversial aspect of it. The fact that if I'm a slave and I escape from the south, I expect from the north, there's no slavery there to be free. But what these kind of like vigilante dog, the bounty hunter guys can capture you and Congress protects that. So right away, like a lot of these compromises, it pisses everyone off. It's not good enough for anyone. And if you're like, is that the lead up to the war in general that everyone is pissed? Yeah, that's how wars usually break out, right? It would be weird if I was like, everyone was happy and they're like, let's have a war anyways, <laughs> right? All right, 1852, on a side note, is the year Uncle Tom's Cabin is, is written. Abraham Lincoln famously said for the press, that woman, you know, is responsible for the war, Harriet, Harriet Beecher Stowe. <laughs> uh, that book really Lincoln's inflamed. Way, really? Lincoln said, that. yeah, he's like, Harriet Beecher Stowe is more responsible. But again, it's a total political book. Obviously, uh -huh. it's, it's a thing that, that was on the front page of the news, right, or whatever. People that would, book was, in today's terms, it was a huge bestseller, even then. Yeah, so absolutely. Oh, Lincoln's getting it was the, no, absolutely, yeah, you're, you're, that's an excellent ex explanatory note, and you're right. It defined that decade. Okay, so we've talked about Wimmel Provisio, Compromise of 1850. Does anyone need Compromise of 1850, the stipulations again? Everyone got them, five points? I don't understand the, why the... California being all free doesn't violate Missouri yeah. compromise because half of California yeah. would be um, south of the 36th I'm not gonna actually it's just the tippy tippy top of California that's above 36th right. the rest is below okay so regardless you're, you're both right but regardless that that's an excellent precise answer and it's a great question it's politics it doesn't nothing matters in politics I mean really I'm not saying to be like jaded and stuff it's like California has uh, a California-like status. You know, it's one of those things like uh, everyone wants analogy, right? Getting punched in the face is like blank. It's really getting punched in the face is kind of like getting punched in the face. Like it's, California is like California, okay? It always has the special status. And California skips over territorial status altogether. That's also a violation. California is part of Mexico, part of Spain, part of Alta California. And all of a sudden, it's like, they don't have to do that. Idaho has to do territorial stats. Make them do a double. They're so irrelevant. Make them do it twice just to piss them off. And they can apply, you know, have them come back tomorrow. Shops closed. I see you guys back there playing cards in hours. Tell Idaho to come back. California is like, put them at the front of the line. They can do whatever they want. They have special status. Is it already settled and structured? Well, structured, absolutely not. Go check out, go time travel back to some of those saloons. Tell me how much structure is there. Okay, well, yeah. But, but, <laughs> structured, no. But settled, yes, you're right. The Oregon Trail and the famous gold rush and all this kind of stuff. Yes, there is a fait accompli about it. That's already like as it is. But what I'm saying is California always, and I, again, I, I joke about California. I do like California a lot, especially for its natural beauty. California is so crazy beautiful and diverse in its natural beauty. If there weren't Californians. <laughs> if but for Californians. But see, we have Californians in the class who are convincing us differently. So this is, this is what this class is so about. It's gonna be a great um, argument of, of opinion. Betsy Johnson, yeah. I'll read you all points again super fast. Point one, point one, California free state, two, Texas war and settled, three, slave trade man in DC, five, Fugitive Slave Act, and to your question, four was popular sovereignty. Meaning, and it's, that's kind of pro-slave, that even if it violates this 3630 parallel, if people vote for it above that, in a place like Nebraska, if they want slavery, well, it's the people's will, it's American democracy, that kind of stuff. Point number three, which by the way, the Kansas Nebraska Act of 1854 is also the famous year of what? What happens in 1854? That was the, wasn't that the convention that basically gave birth to the Republican Party? No, 56, I believe. I oh. think. Yes, 56. Oh. Because the Lincoln's elected in 60. I think Fremont was the first candidate, the Republicans, the, the explorer guy in California as well. You're, you're a little bit before, but you, you're, on a test, I would give you like mad credit, like 75% well, yeah. credit. Yeah, I would. Because you're, because this is, I mean, this is one of these huge things that happens, the destruction of the Whigs and the new coalition forming around this failed lawyer from Springfield um, with top hats. Sick what question, do you on the test? Yeah, Wait, I don't know. Yeah, I was, this thing, 
interesting says that the Free Soil Party merged into the Republican Party in 1854. Right. So Dave's right. So okay, but <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> but wait, wait. He's he's not wrong. He's not wrong. But a lot of it is depending upon how you define dates. The first convention, I think that the, that the Republicans have actual nominated candidate is 56, John Fremont, John C. Fremont. So the party is already kind of forming, you can say maybe even midterm elections, and that kind of thing. But the first time the Republicans, as far as, maybe I'm wrong again, which is, that's fine. I'm happy to be wrong. But I think the first time, and you can look that up too, the first time a Republican candidate is national, runs for the, the presidency on a national scale is Fremont in 56, I believe. Um, okay, we talked about those two. Uh, 1854, Kansas, Nebraska Act. The thing I was looking for, was the Lincoln the Lincoln Douglas debates? The Lincoln Douglas debates. Oh. Mm. It's at this point Lincoln again loses. Lincoln is a great study in perseverance. Honestly, if you want to look at the most Catholic part of Lincoln, it's that value of perseverance. I'm not joking at all. Lincoln is always losing everything he does, and he eventually becomes the most famous president of all time. Maybe next to Washington, Jefferson. Um, Lincoln becomes is that, is that correct? Fremont fifty six. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So again, so we're both right. And I'm, this is not. I, I first of all, I do like this. I like when we're all right. But it's like the party forms earlier, but I mean, the convention, the kind of first national prominence is two years after that. Uh, people begin to see Lincoln as kind of a champion of the, these anti-slavery views. He himself, who had a lot of, Lincoln today would be canceled for racism. Lincoln said stuff like he didn't believe blacks and whites were equal. And he said that he, he didn't think slavery would end until 1958. And again, I'm, I'm not holding that against him as well. Like if someone asks you, if someone asks you today, when do you think a China won't be communist anymore? I mean, like, no one knows, right? The Chinese Communist Party can be going strong for 200 years or end in 10 years. I don't know. Uh, go ask people, look at interviews about, like, in 1987. Reagan, you know, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down that wall. How long will the USSR last? A lot of people thought two, two three more decades. Some people, some people foresaw it's going to crumble right away, but most people didn't probably. So I'm not blaming Lincoln and saying, like, you know, he was a product of his time. I'm just saying Lincoln was not, like, the, the woke guy he's made out to be. So, like, he was always against slavery and stuff. It is kind of this evolution for him, and that's good. It's good for him. But uh, he also we, said at one point that the war wasn't about slavery, but preservation of the union. He there's no, there's no question that's true. That, that, that's why I say it's so important for nuance. I think slavery is the most important cause of the war. The only reason the union fell apart is because he was black. Right, which is funny irony too. But the, the war is about slavery. <clears throat> However, when the war starts, if McClellan doesn't fail epically, so we're going to talk about it soon. The Emancipation Proclamation is probably never issued this. Yeah, I mean, there's, right. This is the whole complex nature that's unfortunate on the kind of Twitter historians of today. It's just this, it's that, 140 characters, whole story. It's never that simple. Yes, question. I wanted to say, just speaking about Abraham Lincoln, they say that when he would go to court, he always carried his Bible. Lincoln, what I know about is religious beliefs. And that's good, that's nice. It's a nice anecdote. Lincoln <laughs> uh, had kind of like, I think, cultural Christian views, kind of like detached, whatever. And it's like, that's, I as a practicing Catholic would want everyone to be and have this like on fire personal relationship with Christ and, and particular sacraments, but I mean, nothing that's bad, but he was culturally Christian. I just also probably wouldn't single him out as some kind of like devout religious person. He was more kind of like, like a lot of these deists, like the creator is kind of like, you know, <clears throat> how, What's the word I'm looking for? He didn't belong to any specific church. No, like a lot of these guys. Yeah, he just kind of he believed in God. He's a deist. Like God made the world, but then doesn't matter. what. Well, just kind of, yeah. Okay, but then he carried his Bible, great. And maybe some of that informed some of his thoughts, which is that's a good thing. It's a positive, let's praise good wherever we find it, right? Uh, Kansas, Nebraska. All right, for a long time, the United States wants a transcontinental railroad. And as you're writing that down, check the chat. What was the third one? Uh, Barbara, excellent question. The third one was uh, slave trade ban in D.C. No slavery in Washington, D.C. No slave trade, no slave market. Like, is, do you know, this is a side track, but is this, do you know about the, um, is this one uh, they gave Alexandria back to Virginia? Alexandria back to Virginia. Yeah, it was part of D.C. originally. It was part of D.C. and there was, okay. I believe, like, there was a slave market there or something. Okay, okay, okay. Um, in order to keep it, yeah. yeah. That, I'm not sure, but that would make sense to kind of skirt around the law. Here's this big slave market in DC. Oh, now it's part of Virginia, right. so it's legal. Yeah, mm -hmm. maybe. I don't know. But that, that would make sense. I don't know if it was the same time. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure, but that would make sense. If, yeah. if, that would, if there would be a move that was designed for that purpose, it would seem that would yeah. come at this time. The US wants to build a transcontinental railroad. Spoiler alert, it's going to be built in 69. It's not going to be built until after the war, 1869. 
They want to connect, right, the East through the Old West, through Northwestern, through Chicago area, Chicago land, so to speak, out into the Badlands, all that kind of stuff. So they introduce a, uh, a bill, okay, in 1854 called the Kansas-Nebraska Act, which says we're going to bring these two new states into the Union, Nebraska free soil, Kansas slave. Compromise. What is the problem? I gave you the context before. What is the problem? The Kansas-Nebraska bill says, for the purpose of getting the territorial stuff out of the way and really stateifying the U.S., and that's a completely made up word, you know, making states out there, really making it formal to build this railroad and have this federal power. We're going to incorporate, we're going to bring in Nebraska and Kansas. Everyone can see Nebraska and Kansas on a map, right? Driving up through Kansas on I-35, then, then 81 into like York, Nebraska, amazing. You haven't lived life till you've done that. Can't, Nebraska on the top is going to be um, free, but Kansas slave. What is the problem? Kansas above the Mason Dixon line. Yes, sir. That's, 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 that, no, no, no. Not the Mason Dixon line, the 36 30 parallel. parallel. Well, you're exactly right. I, I think that's where you're going with it, and that's exactly correct. It also violates the principle set out of popular sovereignty. Does it not? Exactly. Yeah, you're right. Does it not? Hey, I thought we were going to let you decide. What if, what if no one wants slavery there? Well, too bad, right? To appease the Southern slave owner senators, we're just going to pop it there. Right, exactly. Good. Okay, well, this creates, this creates the famous bleeding Kansas, the disaster, what I would argue almost is the true start of the Civil War, okay? Because especially in Kansas, you're going to have a lot of serious, serious angst and anger and outright, this is where the war goes from Cold War. Imagine everything we talked about before from nullification in 1830s through the Wilmot Provisio, the compromises, both of 1820 and 50. All the kind of talking and bickering and anger, this is where the war goes hot. This is where it's like we're actually going to kill each other, burn cities, that kind of stuff. All right? Dave, you had a point, a question. No. I'm, oh, I thought you did. Not at all. I'm disappointed because I could come up with one. You could. Think of something fast. Five seconds. If it was blood. <laughs> As the name would imply. Very good. <laughs> um, okay. So to make, to make a long story short, all right, the two places that really kind of symbolize this. Um, Lecompton versus Topeka. Lecompton is the pro-slave element. Topeka, Kansas is the, um, the, the anti-slavery. Um, there's real, real awful violence, especially in May of 56, okay? The pro-slavery people are going to sack Lawrence, Kansas, which is the home of the Jayhawks, and kind of burn it to the ground, smash windows, just destroy a bunch of stuff. John Brown, who we're going to talk about pretty soon, this is where he gets his reputation. For people who are anti-slavery, and I mean, and, and I agree, I am super, super against slavery. I'm, not, I'm talking about that if anti-slavery was your, your religion, like if your abolition was all that mattered, nothing else matters, like John Brown is seen as a prophet. John Brown is seen as this holy man of God who is put on earth to uh, bring forward a better, freer version. That's a lot of people in New England look at it. The song, John Brown's Body, but to be this kind of almost like pseudo-religious, you know, hymn about him. Uh, you probably know where I'm going next. If you're not, if you're pro-slavery, you definitely thought this, but even if you're just kind of like a moderate person, you're like, yeah, John Brown, maybe I even agree with his ideas, but he kind of sounds like a terrorist. At the Bahamani massacre, he actually kills people with broadswords. I mean, it sounds like a pretty bad guy. He's not even content to, like, I know, right? Literally the eye roll is exactly it. You're pretty intense. That, 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 what's the definition of a terrorist, right? Like, okay, a person who uses terror for political movements, but this is not even like, he doesn't like shoot, you know, mortars into a city or just fight people with guns. He hacks people to death with broadswords. It's the most visceral, brutal, awful kind of like, you know, stuff, hatchet job stuff. He does that towards, towards pro-slavery families in, in Poetami, the Poetami massacre. Kansas makes it clear, makes two things clear, my friends, the Bleeding Kansas ep episode. It makes clear that we're not gonna talk to one another anymore. We're not gonna have a cold war. Both sides cannot agree. This is why the, they're right. People that are like, slavery is the prime cause of the war. It is the prime cause of the war. It's the thing that makes people realize like, we can't, it doesn't matter if I'm in the South, maybe let's say I'm against slavery, but I'm for states' rights in a jurisprudential sense, according to the constitution. And in the North, I as well, like I'm not interested in slavery, but I'm also, I don't like the abolitionists. They're kind of nuts and, you know, way too extreme. And I just want to preserve the union. Those voices are going to be drowned out. It's like, no, the question is going to be slavery. And that free soil question Wilmot tried to propose. And we now see it's going to be settled with broadswords and burning cities to the ground. We're not going to have, we're not going to talk. 
And this is scary, right? When people can't talk anymore, violence comes out. That's bad, I would say. Can I speak a bit about local character Go. of uh, Northwest Arkansas Please. and East Oklahoma? Okay. So North, because for, con for context, because bleeding Kansas is mostly in Southeast Kansas. That's where many people right. are at that yep. point in time. Northwest Arkansas, the character, it's, it, it, there are some plantations, but there aren't many, as from what I can understand. It's like on the very edge of the Ozarks and actual like fields and places where it's fertile. So people in the Ozarks are mountain men, rural, really, it is backwater. Uh, there are, there are smaller settlements here and there, but it's just mainly people out in the woods versus Northwest Arkansas. And this is Fayetteville and Bentonville and Bentonville's a bit is actually built up even at this point in time where it's, uh, yeah, and, and they have plantation houses and, and a bit, it's a bit more like that. Meanwhile, Northeast Oklahoma is Indian territory at the time. It's, it has not become the state of Oklahoma. It's not going to become the state of Oklahoma until the 1900s. However, it's still slaveholding. Uh, the Cherokee, when they were brought west in the Trail of Tears, actually brought their, the institution of slavery with them into Eastern Oklahoma. So that's kind of the overall, the overall look of that part of the world is it's the border between what's you can actually kind of farm and between what is not really farmland. And you have, it's kind of where the institution of slavery starts again when you go from east to west in Arkansas where along the, the Mississippi River Valley, it's heavy and you get in the hills, stops mostly I think from my understanding. And then once you get into the very northwest corner, it starts up again. Good. So that's where you have this, this locus of people who are really interested in preserving or in keeping that institution going and that evil going in Kansas. Okay, very, very good. Excellent answer. And in fact, a great promo why, why you should study history. History is complex, and that's what makes it interesting. Uh, the fact that Cherokees were kicked out of their land, Trail Tears, bad. But then it's like, oh, then they must be good. Well, they also own slavery, bad. Like there's people, like any group of people, and it's like, they, there's no clear cut lines. Like these are the good guys, they're the bad guys. Like the Metoye family in Louisiana, they were uh, free colored Creoles, a group, a classification that of people, of, of people of color um, who were a kind of French, Cajun, and African, Caribbean mix. They were prolific slave owners. Uh, people on, uh, Gary Mills, I think this guy wrote a book about these people. Fascinating story. They were, they were Louisiana people, colored Creoles, um, people of color, again, who were huge plantation owners, had thousands of slaves. And that, that in itself just challenges the narrative. Like CNN would tell you like, oh, it was just all white people and black people. And that was it. <clears throat> that, was, that was true in a lot of ways. But what about the Metsu family? Oh, don't talk about them. It's complex. That's, that's the problem with today's society. Anything that's complex, like, I don't want to know about that because that changes my narrative. You know, like I am super, super proud American and proud Polish. Um, a lot of Poles will do this, like, oh, whine about how bad the Russians were to them. And they were a lot of times. Well, how bad were the Poles to the Ukrainians? Oh, don't talk about that. You know, like every culture and society was oppressed and oppressed someone and vice versa. And what's fun about history, and that, that's not to whitewash and say, well, then nothing matters. As a Catholic, I'm very much on clear lines of morality and things. It's always evil to enslave someone, whatever your skin color. It's always evil to kill people in cold blood. Like, thank God for, <laughs> seriously, people, bumper stickers are the worst. They're so annoying. But someone who has a bumper sticker like 10 commandments, 3,000 some years old, still relevant. That's the good, that's a good bumper sticker. It's right. Like, that's still true. If you follow those 10 rules, like you live a good life and that hasn't changed, right? Go to Exodus 20 and read the 10 commandments. Wow. This is a good way to live life. Don't steal people's stuff. Don't kill people. Don't lust after people's wives. Take their, take their goods. Like that's, that's a pretty good way not to get shot and in the fights with people and, you know, live a good life. Okay. Uh, to keep <laughs> keep away this happen. I'll probably feel rejuvenated if I rest on Sunday, like the common sense. But that's excellent. Thank you for that explanation because yeah, that shows like go back and spelunk through history. It's like, oh man, all people I thought were so good, I, they're kind of bad sometimes and vice versa. Um, so anyways, some great comments here. Let me read on this. Dave, Dave directed Kevin to the YouTube search. Uh, and this is more classes I think as well, you're right, are not posted yet. Kevin, I think the reasons were more like to economics, fight and control between the North and South, the South of the farms, North would take those finished products, creative finished products at a greater profit. Industries more than North. Kevin, this is great. It's true. Indeed, uh, this is the problem with the tariffs and Calhoun and nullification in the 30s. And of course, this is where too, that how everything is, um, it's inextricable. You can't separate one from the other. Well, slavery was the economy in the South tied in, right? And so it is about states' rights. It is about slavery. It is about, it's about all those things kind of together. Economics play a huge, huge thing. Britain and France were dependent on cotton from the Southern states, 70%. 
Yeah, in some ways, I think it was even higher. I think up to 85 or 90 percent because the reason when 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 the war starts, and we'll talk about this in the chronology. There's something called the Trent Crisis when um, Confederate agents are being sent to Europe in November of 1861. The United States Charles Wilkes he seizes this boat, and the British are pissed. They're like, "This is our boat. We can have whoever we want on there." We can have guys who are like stand-up comedians on our boat. It doesn't matter if they're Confederates or not. It's our boat. And there's almost, there is this diplomatic crisis between the U.S. and the Confederacy and Britain. And for a while, Davis is going to do kind of, going to cut off the spigot of cotton to, 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 to uh, Britain, as you said. And Britain's like, we don't care. We had this awesome cotton crop in 1860, actually. And we have warehouses full and we can ride out the storm. Cotton policy becomes a huge, in fact, a lot of the Southern diplomats suck. They suck at diplomacy because they fall back on this truth, Kevin, that you listed, that we have all the cotton. We supply 70, 80, 90% of the world's cotton. We don't have to do anything. I can come in and like show up to a dinner and we're supposed to be black tie naked. And like, how dare you? They're like, well, how about you want your cotton? You're fine, sir. <laughs> Emperor's new clothes. What a nice suit you're wearing. Like they, they honestly think like we can do whatever we want. We have the cotton. They'll just, they'll, they'll play to our, we have that power play. It doesn't work. We'll talk about why um, when the war starts. They're, yeah, they're actually, um, that's when the Egyptian cotton becomes a big thing. The Egyptian cotton, India, and, the, cotton. It, it, and then one third starts coming from India as well, Algeria, the kind of the British empire, right? That's where it's good to have an extensive empire where it's like we can pull resources from different places. Although Egypt is not actually a part of the British Right, but maybe this is something that Indian. drives them into the right, drives them into the arms of the British more in a more formal sense. Um, okay, finishing on Kansas. Help them pick out the right, it's always good. Getting to point out never, never bad decision, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> to finish up with Kansas and Nebraska, Congress and Buchanan, another Pennsylvanian, some people call him the worst president of all time. Um, I don't care. I, I don't know if I agree, but that's what some people say. <laughs> It's like when Trump is like, people are saying, everyone is saying, everyone is saying Buchanan is the worst. But people just say that. I'm not saying that. People say that. Uh, Buchanan and uh, Congress approves the Lecompton Constitution in Kansas, the pro-slavery decision. Uh, and I'm sorry Brian left because he was actually right. He mentioned pop popular sovereignty before. Kansas rejects that 11,000 to 1,000 in the ballot box. So there you go. Congress is like, we're going to impose this pro-slavery constitution on Canada. Like, we don't want that. The people are like, we don't want slavery out here. Brian, you came in like a star, like as you like, called in, like now, you know, talk show. You made the point about, about popular sovereignty, and you're right. The Lecompton Constitution, which Congress tries to impose on Kansas, the pro-slavery constitution, the, the people of Kansas reject, like you said, the popular sovereignty, 11,000 to 1,000 votes. So Kansas is going to be, is eventually going to come, Kansas comes into the Union in 61, the first year of the war as a free state. Okay, uh, last two things, the Dred Scott decision. Dred Scott is a man who is a freed slave who, look how everything ties in well today. He had been freed and he was living in the Northwest Ordinance where slavery is illegal. And he says, uh, I I'm free. He sues for his freedom, this kind of dispute after the, the master dies. And he's like, I'm living in Illinois and Wisconsin. That's free, I should be a free man. And the Dred Supreme Court decides seven to two that he never, that, that in the, one of the most scandalous decisions of all time, that a person of African descent can never be a citizen. So it doesn't matter where he lived. He's African, he can't be a citizen. This is give, that correct? So like the, the slave owning family that you're talking about in New Orleans was not a citizen? No, so the difference was, uh, and again, this is the tricky part of politics before. The idea would be that, and this is very, very kind of tricky jurisprudentially, the, Net, the Metoyer family right. were born free colored Creoles. Right. Which they never were enslaved. Right. And so they were kind of, they, they would not be put to the test, but hypothetically, and we're playing alternate history, which I love, hypothetically, if they had fallen into slavery, then the law would kind of retroactively apply to them. Now that you're in slavery and you have African descent, now you can never be free. But, but if you never were a slave, he was a slave who earned his freedom. And Taney, the Supreme Court justice, the head, argues that um, it doesn't matter if he was freed or not, um, a person of African descent cannot be a, a citizen. Um, the reason, what's so interesting about this decision, I think, is Look how all of us do this with the Supreme Court now. I'm not trying to say I don't respect the Supreme Court, but something like that. Because it's like people will just pick their favorite view, right? If I'm super, super liberal, liberal I'll be like, oh, Brown versus Board, uh, 1954, se segregation, desegregation of schools. That's awesome. And the Supreme Court decided it. And they're always right. Just like when they were right in Plessy versus Ferguson. Oh, wait, no, and Dred Scott. And like vice versa, right? And vice versa, right? 
the, your favorite conservative decision, right? And then you'd be like, oh, the, if, if the Supreme Court overturns Roe versus Wade, a lot of people will say, instead of arguing they should, well, it should be overturned because abortion is wrong. I would say make that argument. Not like the Supreme Court is sacred. Oh, you mean like these nine liberal decisions? You agree with them too? The Supreme Court is very, very interesting that it really, really, whatever your favorite issue is, if you go to the wall and say, I believe this because of the authority of the Supreme Court, I'll show you five decisions on the opposite side. Where you're like, oh, wait, I, I want to disown them. That don't, I don't like them. The su same Supreme Court that gives us Brown versus Board and no segregated schools gives us Dred Scott and gives us Plessy versus Ferguson, the famous uh, separate but equal, the, the Jim Crow era, gives us Williams versus Mississippi. If your grandfather was enslaved and couldn't vote, you can never vote. So it's like, relax on the Supreme Court stuff. Relax, please. Uh, the, one of the Supreme Court decisions, I think, uh, Bell versus something, uh, Buck versus Bell, like it says eugenics is great. I think Oliver Wendell Holmes, the Supreme Court, Buck versus Bell, thank you. He says famously, he's like, three generations of imbeciles is enough. Like we should sterilize people. Yeah, some people should not be allowed to have kids. So do not, do not think that the Supreme Court, ooh, like up here high and mighty. They've had yeah, a lot of progressive. And that was progressive. So there's, your, there's your progressive people. So it's like, it's just, it's very, very convoluted. Last thing, John Brown. Look, we're going to finish mad early today. We are going to be done. Class ends at 2.30. We're not going to be done at 2.30. Unless I go, it'd be a hilarious prank. Just go straight dead silent can right I now. Can I go back to the Supreme Court though? No. Yes, of course you can. <laughs> the reason the Supreme Court gets the status is because the legislature refuses to legislate. And so the Supreme Fair. Court just throws it off on them. makes these decisions because the legislature is like too much of a hot button for me. We don't know how to deal with it. And that's how it ends yeah. up in the yeah. Supreme yeah. Court. It's also like the Montesquieu idea of um, uh, division of powers, right? And there's, there should be aristocratic and uh, democratic and monarchical um, elements to a government, right? So there should be a, a, a branch of the government that's not subject to um, not elected, not, yeah, right, exactly. Yeah. Well, and to piggyback on Marie, I agree. And uh, another part of that, then, of course, is that the president seems to be relying more on presidential mandates than congressional action, which pulls the Supreme Court in then to determine the AMA that is not constitutional. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And finally, the Supreme Court can weigh in on the rights of minorities that would have no rights under a democratic system. Okay. So as long as it's constitutional, the Supreme Court can can take that side. Right. Not being a huge Supreme Court fan because currently it's very manipulated by the political system, but it's the thinking behind it. So I'm just gonna jump in on that and then I'm done. That's great. No, thank you. I, you know, myself, I go on so many tangents that that actually is very on topic. That's very, on, that's not a tangent. I love to go off topic and talk about different stuff. Um, that makes the class fun because we all, I really, we all learn together. And I never thought of that or this, right? I leave the class often with those thoughts in my mind of all the kind of things that kind of on their own come up. So please, that's always great. Um, but last thing we're going to talk about today, and let me, I'm going to do the recap now because I want to just like finish now. We talked about Wilmot Provisio and all of these in some way have this kind of slavery question around them. Wilmot Provisio of 46, Compromise of 1850, the five points we discussed of that, Kansas-Nebraska Act, how it leads directly into bleeding Kansas and how uh, the questions of popular sovereignty really are strong because when the government tries to impose a pro-slavery settlement on Kansas, it itself rejects it. I am not a mathematician. I'm pretty sure 11,000 to 1,000 is a pretty stunning rebuke. That's not close, right? You know, oh, a lot. How, how much did you, how many votes were cast? 12,000. How many did you guys get? 1,000. It was close though. We almost had it there for a little bit, right? What was the football score? 81 to nothing. But it was 0 0 when the game started. And it didn't start that way. Couldn't hold on. Yeah. I mean, they scored six touchdowns in the first quarter, but it got out of hand at that point. So, so last thing, and then Dred Scott, we just talked about now, John Brown, October 16th, 18, 1859. John Brown, the amazing freedom, freedom fighter hero. John Brown, the terrorist. Depending upon, and that is that society is so polarized on this. The way people feel about John Brown, people feel about the whole Civil War at large. Depending, on, and so Brown, what does he do? Well, let me give you a quick couple backgrounds here. The Stono Rebellion. Read about the Stono Rebellion of 1739 in South Carolina. Read about the more famous Nat Turner uprisings, which were slave revolts in 1831. 
Most famous is the rebellion in Haiti in 1791. People accuse John Brown of trying to create a new Haiti. Haiti have a rebellion against French colonial rule and actually overthrow the French, earn their independence in 1804. It's one of the most bloody, awful, huge atrocities on both sides. I think just total guerrilla warfare. Just, yeah, awful, awful kind of. And genocide. All of the whites were. Very much. With the exception of some Polish mercenaries who fought for the Haitians. Right. All the whites were. Just a very, very. Mastered, ugly, except the women that they raped. A very ugly situation. So people that are against Brown, people for Brown are saying, He's going to try to create freedom, and he's going to sometimes you have to take up arms. Where he he is going to be put in what box? Like always, everyone is in America. He's a new George Washington. He's fighting for freedom. People against him are saying he's just a kind of crazy maniac who wants to burn everything to the ground. He raids him and a bunch of guerrillas raid an arsenal in Harper's Ferry. I said before, now West Virginia in October of 1859, he fails. Just period. Like it's it's a total failure. Doesn't really kind of get off the ground. But people realize, and he's sentenced to death, he's executed on December 2nd, 1859. What's interesting is, even Brown's opponents who hate him are like, he dies like a man. Like, he, had a, he was not, like, he didn't, like, try to run away from his cell or, like, wasn't cursing people. He's kind of like, yeah, I deserve to be hanged. I would hang myself, too, if I was the opposition. Of course, I tried to rebel this country, but I don't regret it at all. I thought it was correct. It's actually one of the, like, most noble parts of his life, I think, where he's just like, oh, yeah, I tried to overthrow the government. I should die. I'm not, I'm not sorry. God bless all you guys. Whatever, no, no, no hard feelings, whatever. And I'm saying that with all due respect. Even both sides, the people that are lionized him and they, they hate his gods, are like, well, that was I respect him for that. Whatever that means, whatever you want to take from that. Again, I will never, ever, ever tell you how to interpret events or how you think. You decide on that. But it is true that he has kind of. He doesn't like burn everything down on his way out. He's like, yep, yeah, this is not. So I kind of wanted this almost. Even. If it didn't work out, I died for my cause. Um. At that point, people are like, this is it. This is over, all right? If you want a really good book, oh man, if you want to like salivate onto the pages like an animal, uh, David Potter, Impending Crisis, is the best book written on the antebellum period. It is seriously so, so good. David Potter, Impending Crisis, a book from 1977, so it's mad old. I remember back then I was like in my early 20s. You know, live in the 70s, John Travolta, disco, all that, and uh, read this book, it changed my life. What I mean, it make me a historian. <laughs> so who was allowed to vote during this time period? Who actually was allowed to vote? Who, who voted in America in the 1850s? Yeah. Like just landowning men, I think. Landowning Yeah, men. I think so. Hmm. Um, it depends from state to state whether property ownership is required or not. Right. But, that was most that was but often the required. more oligarchic rule would tend towards that like yeah. the, and it's going to be in certain proper ownership right you know a certain amount of acreage or... all right we're done uh i wish you all I, i'm always kind of thinking i want to say i wish you a good weekend i don't because we're going to meet on wednesday still uh really quickly what's what's of import look first of all again i i don't want to get tired of saying this this is freaking awesome we have 22 people total this is amazing <laughs> thank god i'm so i'm over the moon this, this is like better than pre-COVID numbers. Those of you like Betsy, the Schmitz, they've been here the whole time since the start when I arrived in the fall of 19. Before COVID hit, for some of our classes, we had like, like 15 or 16 people. It was a good thing. And then the pandemic hit and we kind of fell down to probably eight or nine people, which is still nice. That's great for a non-credit course. But the fact that we have 22 people now is like, I am just shocked and just so honored. Um, so thank you again for that. Let's keep this up. This is going to be super fun. We are kind of taking a little diversion now. As you saw in the syllabus earlier, we're done with the antebellum period, right? And I'm not going to recap it now because I said we're done, it'll take too long. But we've the, the first three lectures and, and rewatch them. Kevin, to your question, when those are posted, rewatch these first three lectures if you missed something. We've covered everything from the founding of America, remember Congress, Greco Roman, all those themes through now John Brown to where the next classes we're going to be discussing books and then playing a game. And then we just start the war and we don't stop for a month. We just like go like hard on the war. It's like, you're gonna be exhausted in the trenches. And I'm like, you need to keep firing that artillery. Mm -hmm. Keep on that chronology. We're gonna just go, 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 go. And really have the whole chronological kind of cocoon wrapped up before spring break, before you return to more kind of in-depth arguments. That's what's gonna be so fun about this class is that you're gonna get the, the, the stats down so well, where things matter historically, and then read these historical arguments. You're gonna tell me why you think it's terrible. This historian is, should not be allowed to write. So I disagree, or I so agree, this book changed my life, whatever. Of that we're done, in the last 30 seconds, all I want to say, and again, and with thank you, my gratitude, is this Wednesday, I hope all of you will come out. It's on Zoom, too. 
um, my first HIPAA lecture of the semester. I promoted this so many times. You, you're dang right. I'm going to promote it again on Wednesday. Yeah. I'm going to do this exact same talk on Wednesday. Sorry. Deal with it. It's called Label Catholics, How and Why Not to Be One. And it is a 40-minute, unrelenting roast of people. So much so that I said, I see so many mean things. I have to at the end say, well, they're not that bad overall. And then I give myself this horrible compliment. <laughs> We're like, they're not bad, but compared to me, this is terrible. It's so gross. And then I finish up kind of explaining like how you should act. <laughs> I can't, I, I've worked on this talk actually for a long time. Um, I love all this talks I get to do. Um, but I would say if, if I had a rank in the, I think I've given 35, 40 talks I've been here. I would say, I don't know if this is the best one I've given, but definitely top five probably. I just hope you'll come out. It's, I think it's gonna be good. I really think it's gonna be really good. Yeah, just it's like Napoleon Dynamite when he's like, uh, like, are you good at drawing magical creatures? He's like, I'm probably the best I know, you know, to be honest. Um, I, just, I just can't get enough of the humility. That, that, I actually don't say, I actually say at the end, I actually say at the end. So I'm like, this is the one spoiler I'll give you. I say at the end, like, uh, well, all these people that I talked about, like I criticize their ideas. I'm like, you know, like I'm not above criticism just because I'm, and I list like nine, like really cocky things just because I'm blank, blank, blank. doesn't mean that I'm above criticism. And the last one I go is like, just because I'm insanely modest doesn't mean you can't criticize me. Um, didn't you give the difference like humility? I did. <laughs> <laughs> hey, but what did you say? No, tell, talk about the Achilles thing with the false humility. 